Election programs on KSPS are brought to you with the support of CenturyLink, keeping you connected to what matters most. CenturyLink, your link to what's next. For more than a decade, Kathy McMorris Rogers has represented Eastern Washington in Congress. The Republican is seeking her seventh term. To return to Washington, D.C., she must beat Joe Pocotas, who ran for Congress two years ago. He is back hoping to unseat the incumbent. Hear how each would represent Eastern Washington. Join us for the 5th District Congressional Debate. And good evening and welcome to this KSPS election special. We're pleased to feature a debate with the candidates running for U.S. House of Representatives in Washington's 5th District. I'm Christy Gordon, moderator for tonight's proceedings. The 5th District is Washington's second largest district. It includes the following counties, Ferry, Stevens, Pend Oreille, Lincoln, Spokane, Adams, Whitman, Columbia, Garfield, Soton, and part of Walla Walla County. The candidates in this race are Kathy McMorris Rogers and Joe Pocotas. Let's meet them. Republican incumbent Kathy McMorris Rogers is serving her sixth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. The congresswoman served at the state level for 10 years as a representative in Washington's 7th district. She grew up in Kettle Falls and is married with three children. Democrat Joe Pocotas is the chief executive officer for the Spokane Tribe. He's also served on the Colville Tribal Council as chairman. Mr. Pocotas grew up in Inchileum. He's married and has four children and seven grandchildren. This is his second run for this office. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. So for this debate, the candidates have agreed to follow our debate rules. The reporter panel will ask the same question to both candidates, or a panel member may direct a question to just one candidate. Reporter panel members may request a follow-up to an answer. Answers will be limited to one minute. Rebuttal length will be limited to 30 seconds. For this debate, the candidates will answer questions from a panel of Spokane journalists, and they are from the Spokesman Review, reporter Kip Hill, from Creme 2 News, anchor Whitney Ward, and from KXOY 4 News, the anchor of Good Morning Northwest, Derek Dice. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So let's begin with opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute, and Representative McMorris Rogers, you go first. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be involved. It is an honor for me to represent you in Congress, and I work hard every day to listen, to learn, and then to advocate and lead for you in the People's House. I know that people are angry with Congress. I hear the frustration. I've tried to take that frustration and turn it into smart solutions, working in a bipartisan fashion, whether it's on uh, taking action on our wildfires that we've seen in eastern Washington recently, the passage of the ABLE Act that provides for tax-free savings accounts for those with disabilities, or the Steve Gleason Act, important legislation to counter uh, those that wanted to take away eye-directed technology Amazing technology for those that have lost their ability to speak. But this legislation underscored a larger problem. Why was a federal agency making that decision to begin with? I've introduced legislation to review, rethink, eliminate programs that are currently running on autopilot. My goal is to serve the people and restore the people's voice in our government. All right, thank you, Mr. Pakotas. Good evening. Thank you to KSBS for hosting tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm Joe Cotas. I have lived in, Inch er, in Eastern Washington most of my life. I grew up in Inchilem. I've been married for 44, 41 years. I'm a father of four grown children and, as you said, I have seven grandchildren. Congress has serious issues today with an approval rating of only 9%. The American people are fed up with their ineffectiveness and gridlock. We need new representation, better leadership, and elected officials that are willing to work more than 112 days of the year. The only way to change that is change Congress. I am qualified and willing to take on this challenge. My goal is not to gain political power. My goal is to make Congress work for you. Tonight, I hope to gain your trust and prove why we so desperately need new representation in Congress. Thank you. All right, thank you to you both, and we'll start off with our questions. Kip, you'll have the first question, and Mr. Pakotas, you'll go ahead and answer this one first. Uh, thanks, Christy. Uh, it might seem an odd place to start in a congressional debate, but a lot of people's focus is on the top of the ticket. Who are you voting for in the presidential campaign and why? 
I'll be voting for Hillary Clinton, and I think a lot of the, the reasons are obvious in looking at some of the campaign and some of the rhetoric that's happening today in, in uh, the election. Some of the rhetoric that's happening, it's, it's promoting racism, bigotry, and you look at the misogynistic attitudes and things from one of the candidates, and you just wonder why he can generate so much support. Hillary Clinton has the ability, has the background, has the experience to lead this country forward. And I think she's proven that. She's been in Congress or in, in public view for over 30 years now. And, you know, there, there's concerns with her that many people uh, have, maybe her untrustworthiness and that, but most of that is, is projected through the media and on TV. You know, I'd like to see the facts of that before I am going to decide and change my mind um, in voting against Hillary or voting for another candidate. But I will be casting my vote for Hillary Clinton. All right. Representative McMorris Riders? I'll be voting for Donald Trump. And I believe that he's going to bring the, the positive disruption that we need to see in our government, challenging the status quo, bringing genuine accountability. Uh, and unfortunately, I see Hillary Clinton as someone who is not trustworthy. Uh, she's deliberately misled the American people. Uh, and too many examples. And I don't believe that she will bring the, the change to the status quo. She believes uh, in top-down government knows best approaches that I believe need to be changed so that we see people empowered and people's voices reflected in our government. Can I follow up? Uh, there have been recent reports that potentially Donald Trump avoided paying federal income taxes for a long time, maybe up to two decades. There's also concerns about some deals with Cuba that he may have made when he was a private businessman. Do any of those give you pause as you cast your vote? You know, I've uh, made it very clear that there's things that Donald Trump has said and done that give, you know, that uh, I, I don't agree with. I believe in be being very transparent. What I see in him is someone that can bring the change that we need at the top, challenge the status quo. I see him as a businessman that knows how to create jobs, grow our economy. And unfortunately, in Hillary Clinton, I see someone that has not proven herself trustworthy. And I believe that it's going to be the status quo, top-down government knows best approach to problem solving. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. And Whitney will have this next question. And uh, Representative Morris Rogers, you will answer this one first. Okay. So based on your response to that first question, how are you both prepared to work under a president if your candidate does not win? And what can be done to end much of the partisan gridlock that we have seen for so many months and years that keeps things from getting done on both sides of the aisle? That's a great question. Um, I lead by example. And you look at my record and I'm someone that has worked looked for opportunities to work across the aisle. And I'm someone that has worked on issues important to Eastern Washington in a bipartisan way, whether it is catastrophic wildfires that are, we've been facing and working with Senator Maria Cantwell uh, right now on legislation that will help prevent and fund the fighting of fire, uh, those fires. I've also worked on the ABLE Act, bipartisan. Uh, I've worked uh, for uh, Fairchild Air Force Base. But it, as it comes to the next president, I believe that one of the most important fundamental issues for us in this country is representative government and ensuring that Congress is functioning as an equal branch of government and is uh, functioning in a way that will hold the administration accountable, no, no matter who it is, exercise the power of the purse, and, and really, on behalf of the people, make sure that that accountability, accountability is in our government. <clears throat> Mr. Bacota. I do have concerns with how Congress is, is acting today and how um, the administration is being, I guess, shunned and pushed aside sometimes. I highly respect the office of the president, and I'm willing to work with President Trump if, if that so happens. It is kind of scary thinking about that and looking at that and seeing some of the issues and how things are treated, and especially being a person of color and, and how the people of color are actually treated in today's day and age, um, according to how politics is going. I am able to work across the lines. As chairman of the Cobble Tribe, I was required to work with city governments, county governments, state governments, and federal governments also, just alike. You know, and we had many, many issues, jurisdictional issues, sovereignty issues. You look at Congress today and how things have happened. And when President Obama took his oath of office, and immediately after that, Mitch McConnell took another oath of office. 
providing to the American people that he's going to make sure that this president is a one-term president. That's where the gridlock and the partisanship started. Uh, Representative, you uh, can have 30 seconds for a rebuttal if you like. Um, well, I think, uh, yes, I am willing to work with whoever is elected president. Uh, I will respect the people's decision in that. But I think it uh, is most important that the House and the Senate, on behalf of the people, is functioning effectively, that we are restoring the people's voice, people's priorities in the legislating process. And that's where I've uh, introduced legislation like the USA Act, unauthorized spending, that is requiring the review, the rethinking, eliminating of some programs that are on autopilot, but is putting the people back in charge of this government. And it allows us an opportunity to reimagine some of these programs in a way that meets today's needs. Mr. Bacotas, you can have 30 seconds. Yeah, that's kind of interesting to hear that, that she's willing to work across party lines and seeing how Congress has been reacting in the last few years. And I'm glad that she brought up the USA Act also. The reason that they're having to approve a new bill to, uh, as far as USA Act is because Congress has not been doing their job in the past. There's many programs that affect eastern Washington that are in that category of unauthorized. And if they are, uh, if this USA Act goes into play, then they're going to be diminished um, throughout the years if Congress does not reauthorize them. So it's up to them. It's their choice. Affordable Care Act is, in, is part of that. The um, SNAP program is part of that also. All right. Thank you. Derek, you have the next question. And Mr. Bacotas, you'll answer this one first. The U.S. admitted over 12,000 Syrian refugees in the fiscal year 2016. And while many Americans welcome these men, women, and children from Syria, others worry that the U.S. is becoming a safe haven for people with potential terrorist ties. How do you think uh, the U.S. should act moving forward uh, with these refugees fleeing violence and terrorism? I do support them coming in to the United States. We've been a country of open arms since uh, 1492, you might say. And I, I do support that. These people are running from very, very dangerous times in their life, and many of them are, are leaving because of their families are being um, slaughtered in those countries. The United States has a vetting process today. I understand it's about 18 months to two years to do complete vetting of these individuals before they come into the United States. But we've always been a country with open arms, and I think that we need to afford those people that, that opportunity. Uh, you know, the United States is, is uh, the place where people can re uh, realize their dreams of freedom. And that's what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can allow them that opportunity. All right, thank you. And uh, Representative McMorris Rogers. The, the situation in Syria is really heartbreaking. When you look at nearly half of the population of Syria is uh, either refugees or fleeing or uh, disrupted. And I, th and I think that um, it's important that we are helping, uh, that we are helping provide assistance to those that are fleeing. Um, I do believe that it is important as we make these decisions that we keep the safety and the, the security of this country first and foremost. That is our number one responsibility within the federal government. And I was at a security briefing, uh, it was a joint House Senate security briefing where the FBI director himself told us that he could not verify that these Syrian refugees would meet uh, security um, um, requirements, that we did not have a vetting process in place that he could ensure that. And so I have supported legislation that would call for a halt to the Syrian refugee program, bringing them to America until we can ensure that they are vetted in a way that will uh, protect this country. Mr. Bacotas? That's great, you know, but we do have a vetting process in place, and that has been in place. And some of the options that are going on today or some of the rhetoric that's going on today as far as um, refusing certain individuals because of their race, religion, or gender sometimes in the United States is, is something that we need to correct. And as Syrian refugees, many of them are going to be women and children. And they're going to be, as I said, you know, that we do have a vetting process in place. And some of the Congress, some of the uh, candidates do not believe that or don't, don't think that, you know, because they want to instill this fear in the American people. Right. Representative? As it relates to the Syrian refugees, the, the FBI director himself said that it would not be possible 
to vet these refugees at this time uh, that we did not have a system in place, and that's why I supported the legislation. I would support uh, us as a country supporting temporary facilities uh, so that those women and children in need, I recognize that they are fleeing some terrible conditions, and uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to, to see what has happened. Um, but I think that we can do it in a way that also ensures that we as a country are making smart decisions that will ensure our safety. Okay, next question is from Kip and uh, Representative McMorris Rogers. You, you'll answer this one first. Okay. Let's uh, move to um, potential gun control legislation. Um, in a recent debate, uh, Donald Trump said that he might be open to the idea of, of um, restricting gun sales to people that are on terrorism watch lists. And that's mm -hmm. something that Hillary Clinton has also said that she supports. If that type of legislation comes up in Congress, do you support it or would you support legislation that would outlaw gun sales to people on terrorism watch lists? Right. Well, I, I believe it's very important uh, as we think through how to have smart policies that we also, you know, that we ensure their constitutional rights. And the terrorism watch lists, I think, um, there's not the constitutional rights of the individuals also need to be respected that end up on that list. And right now, someone it's very unclear as to why you end up on that list, and it's uh, unclear as to how you get off of that list. And so uh, the constitutional rights, to, to take someone's constitutional right away without having protecting their uh, constitutional rights, uh, uh, to take it away without them having their day in court, I think would be wrong. So um, we were looking at how to ensure that that list is maintained in a way that it really makes sure that they are terrorists before we take any action. I would support that. And I'm a gun owner myself, and I've taught each one of my six or six of my seven grandchildren how to operate or maintain a gun and safety and, and also to hunt. I support the Second Amendment because I am a gun owner and I'm not going to be taking anybody's guns away. The issue here is not only about constitutional rights. Many of these people have lost their own constitutional rights. We're not taking them away from them, their guns. They've lost them themselves. You look at the, the, the no-fly zone people that cannot fly in the United States and also you take a look at the felons. They have taken away their own constitutional rights. The Congress is, and I'm not going to be doing that. So I do support, you know, reinstituting the uh, the ban, or so to speak, on uh, sale of weapons, especially to, to uh, people that are not authorized to even fly in the United States and come to the United States. You, you talk about a ban. Are you in favor of an assault weapons ban? I would be in, in favor of bringing that assault weapon ban, assault weapon ban back. I and, and I think that was instituted during George Bush times, and the sunset had uh, diminished on that just recently, and I'd be in favor of reinstituting re that ban. Representative, you can have a 30-second rebuttal if you like. Well, I, I too am a gun owner. I'm a, a strong believer in the Second Amendment. When it comes to the terrorist watch list, I think it's important to recognize that a, a fundamental constitutional right is to ensure your day in court also. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting all of those constitutional rights. All right, Mr. Picotas. Yeah, and, and that's, I'm, I'm, I agree with that. You know, but as I said, we're not the ones that are taking their constitutional rights away from them. They've re taken them away from them themselves. Okay, and let's go with Whitney with the next question. And Mr. Picotis, you'll answer this one first. Uh, what do you think is the federal government's role in, the, in trying to ease the racial tension that we have seen so much? We've been hearing so many uh, times about police shootings. That um, it, Do you think it is a call for more de-escalation training? And what specifically is the role of the federal government? Should there be more oversight at the federal level? I think a little bit less rhetoric about what's going on today, about people of color and, and the Hispanic and the racism that's talked about with them and, and denying access to the United States by certain religious groups. I think stopping that is, is a good place to start. Some of the problem that we have, and people are, are kind of pushing that out nowadays. There, you see more and more of it on the streets. And one of our presidential candidates is talking that, but Congress is not saying that that's not okay. They're basically being silent about it, and it's okay. So the American people are feeling a little bit more secure about um, ex you know, talking about the racist attitudes and, and looking at deporting um, millions of, of uh, undocumented Hispanics and that. So 
Congress does have a, a place in there, and I think that would be a great place to start in working with the communities in, in certain areas. And, you know, I think some cultural sensitivity would be helpful for a lot of them also, and that's, I think, a person of color could bring that to Congress. I want to maybe re-ask the question, because I'm not sure that you okay. answered it. When we're talking about the federal government's role, do you think that there is a need for more oversight or training when it comes to police shootings of other people of other races? Certainly. I think they do. You know, and looking at the laws and rules and regulations, and the states also have a lot of requirement for doing that, too. You know, I do, I, I do um, support the police officers, and they have a, a tough job in the United States in, in protecting and serving the people. But there's a few that take it to the extreme, and I think you're seeing more and more of that as we're going through, through the, the days and the amount of um, slaughters, the amount of, amount, amount of mass shootings that are going on, and some of the police officers that are killing innocent uh, Americans, uh, unarmed Americans. So Congress does have a role in that, and I think Congress would, would uh, just in their attitude, would display a lot of that. Right. Uh, Representative okay. Boris Rogers. Well, when it comes to racial tensions in the country and especially as it, how it impacts uh, local law enforcement, I think it's very important. You know, we cherish as Americans uh, a belief that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, that you have equal protection under the law, equal application of the law. I've, uh, I've talked to local sheriffs, local law enforcement, and what they tell me is that they do need more training uh, and a belief in community policing. From a federal perspective, I, I have supported um, us uh, taking a look at it federally, too, and seeing if there is some action that we should be taking. We have a, uh, a task force right now in the House that is led by John Lewis, who's one of the civil rights leaders of our, our time. Uh, he's congressman out of Georgia and other members like uh, Congressman Dave Riker, right here from uh, Washington State, former sheriff in King County, are a part of this task force. They're meeting, meeting regularly even right now um, and going around the country to look at what is the federal, what is an appropriate federal response to uh, so that we are providing the support that we should. And Mr. Bacotis, you can have 30 seconds if you like. Also, I think part of the training and education would be a police force, I guess, resembling more of the community. Um, you know, allowing more um, people of color on a police force and that they're working in the communities that they're in. And some of that cultural training also would be helpful for them, understanding the people that they're working with and understanding the people that they're uh, sworn to protect and knowing the differences between them. And, you know, living on a reservation and we're treated completely different when you come off the reservation. And that is prevalent in the United States, not only with Indian people, but people of color. Representative? Well, I think it's also important to, to uh, highlight the recognition that uh, the city of Spokane has received in this regard, that they've had the conversation and that they were even uh, invited to the White House recently to participate in uh, this discussion and uh, the, the, the leadership that the city of Spokane has shown uh, as a community, bringing people together, having a conversation and taking action locally. Uh, I think those are the kind of approaches that need to be repeated across the country. Next question is from Derek and uh, Representative McMorris Rogers. You will answer this one first. Yeah, it seems that Obamacare or the Affordable Air Care Act is here to stay, and we know you have differing stances on this, but assuming it is indeed here to stay, what is each of your plans to improve upon it in the future? Well, I think it is very important that we, uh, well, I think the debate over health care is, is going to continue. And how do we ensure that everyone in this country has access to quality and affordable health care? Unfortunately, the, the promises that were made in the Affordable Care Act are not being, are not being seen. Uh, people are not able to keep the plan of their choice. You're seeing premiums go up. In Washington State, double-digit premium increases. Uh, so what I would like to see is uh, I would like to see a repeal of the individual mandate, a repeal of the employer mandate, a repeal of the regulations uh, on the states and to open up states to have for a, a larger marketplace so that individuals and families will have choices for more plans uh, that would meet their individual needs, the needs of themselves and their families. Right now, we're seeing less choice, uh, less plans, and, and they're costing more, more higher premiums, more co-pays. And so we need the marketplace to be opened up and expanded. Yeah, I support the Affordable Care Act, <clears throat> excuse me, as it was written originally, and also I support somewhat today. 
I do um, think that we need to reinstitute some of the options that were taken out, and that would be the single-payer option and also the options for the federal government to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for cheaper drug prices. If you think about the promises that were made, those promises were taken out when President Obama offered his bill to the Republican Congress um, early on so that he could gain their support for the bill, so that he could have overwhelming support when it, was, when it came before Congress. Well, that didn't last very long, and Congress, had, uh, Republican, had taken a shot at it and taken all of those, those provisions out of the bill. And when it came up for a vote, did one of, the con one of the Republicans vote for the bill? I don't believe so. So we have the bill that was watered down, and now they really um, oppose that bill, and they've been voting over 60 times to repeal it. We have 20 million Americans that are insured today and 29 million more that need insurance. And we also have our young children that can stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26 years old, which is a great help for them. Yeah, and, I, and I support um, pre-existing condition um, language. I support those up to 26 being allowed to stay on their parents' plan. Um, I, just, I see this as a, a top-down government-knows-best approach that is limiting choices. Uh, one big issue that I have been uh, working on is ensuring that we have more providers right here in eastern Washington. We need more doctors, and I'm excited about the new medical school. But whether it's providing doctors to go into the rural areas, onto the tribal reservations, uh, the VA, uh, we need more doctors. And, and that's going to be a, uh, an area where I continue to work. There's been efforts, as I said, you know, to repeal this, this bill for um, many, many times and cost the American taxpayers millions of dollars in doing that. And also, there's been a promise to have a, a bill in place that is going to be just as good or better than the Affordable Care Act. And that has not happened yet. After the 60-some-odd votes to repeal it, we were promised that from the Republican Party, and that has not happened. It's not in place yet. So the Affordable Care Act, as I said, is a, is a, is a lifesaver for many millions of Americans that live below the poverty rate also. All right, thank you. Uh, Kip, next question. Yep. And um, Mr. Bacotis, you'll take this one. Yeah, let's talk about another issue that hits people's pocketbooks, um, the, mi the minimum wage. Washington State has one of the highest minimum wages in the country, but you in Congress would have the authority basically to raise the federal minimum wage for the first time in several years. Does that need to happen, and how much does it need to be raised? It certainly does need to happen. People that are working full-time, 40 hours a week, should not live in poverty. And in eastern Washington, we got quite a bit of people that are living in poverty that are working full-time. The minimum wage at $15 an hour, in some cases, would still be a little bit low. And that's been a proposal, and, and I would be in favor and support of that. If you take a look at history and, and how raises have, uh, or how salaries have increased for certain individuals, CEOs and salaries have increased hugely. And if the minimum wage had kept up with that increase, um, according to cost of living, minimum wage today would be around $22 per hour. And you take a look at that and, and think about that. And, and here in Spokane County, for a family of two, husband and wife, to survive and to be able to afford rent of a two-bedroom two apartment, they would have to be making about $14.87 per hour to do that. And if there are people that have a family with children, then that number has to go up quite a bit more. So $15 an hour would be right at the limit for that. Do you, do you think that businesses in Spokane would be able to support a $22 an hour minimum wage? Not today, no. But then you could work that up to them. You know, something about that, too, with businesses, you know, you hear that there, there's, a, there's fear going around that it's going to kill businesses and that. And Seattle is a pretty perfect example of that. Those people that are living below the um, minimum wage area or even making minimum wage, they, can't, they did not go out and spend their money someplace else. They spend their money locally within the, the businesses here in town. So that would help thrive a little bit more. That bring a little bit more money back to these local businesses. You know, they may be paying a little bit higher salary, but they're going to re regain that with the business that they're going to be um, providing. All right, Representative. When it comes to the, uh, raising the federal minimum wage, I believe that that is a decision that is best left uh, at the local level and at the state level. When you look at the, the differences across this country, even across the state, as to the cost of living, I think that that should be taken into consideration. Um, we need to be focused on 
job creation, on, on providing opportunities for people to have more jobs and better paying jobs. You think about the important role a job is in your life. It's uh, what gives you purpose and dignity. It's way more than a paycheck. And so we need more jobs and policies that will encourage more jobs. What do you think of that $22 an hour mark? Do you think that's too high? I, I would have uh, significant concerns about the impact that that would have. And, and that, needs to be, that needs to be a decision that is made at the local level. Okay. Uh, well, we can do a 30-second rebuttal, if you like. Well, you know, as I said, you know, $22 an hour would be pretty high right now. Right. And we could slowly build up to that and make it affordable for the American people, especially in 5th Congressional District, where we have 28% people in 5th in Congressional District that live below the federal poverty rate. 21% of those people are children. And, you know, they cannot afford sometimes food on our table. Um, because of these low rates, low wages that they're receiving. So naturally, we need to up that. And as I said, it's going to increase the economy, build the economies in locally, local areas. The way that you create jobs and create more opportunities is uh, um, it's not by more mandates and more requirements. And, and I think... Um, we, we want more jobs. We need more training. Uh, we, uh, as I travel around eastern Washington and as I um, hear from employers, uh, family businesses, the farmers, you know, one, one big issue is the workforce and the training that we need uh, for individuals so that they can meet the workforce needs. 85% uh, of the jobs are going to need some kind of post-secondary, and that, that is a way that you get the workforce and then you create more opportunities and better paying jobs. Okay, Whitney, next question uh, for Representative McMorris Rogers first. Uh, my question has to do with immigration, but I want to make it clear it is separate from the Syrian refugee issue that we have been uh, discussing earlier. Donald Trump has um, stated on multiple occasions that he intends to build a wall at the Mexican border. Uh, but how do you think the federal, the federal government needs to be handling the millions of undocumented immigrants who are already here, whether they're from Mexico or elsewhere? Is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I believe that we need to fix a broken immigration system. Um, I supported building the wall. I supported the legislation um, years ago that initiated the, the, the building of a, a fence and making sure that as a country we are safe and secure. Um, there's other steps to take in, in, in fixing in the immigration uh, process. I think it begins with border security, and we need to make sure that the border is secure. I think we also need a workable ag guest worker program. Right here in Washington State, we don't have enough uh, people that are coming to help with agriculture every year. Uh, Microsoft, uh, the visa, 40% uh, of those who are here undocumented actually overstayed their visa. We need visa reform. And for those that are currently here undocumented, I, I think we, sh we can set up criteria by which um, they they, if they meet this criteria, they can get in line. I do not support a separate path to citizenship, though, um, that some have proposed. My opponent talks about the, the uh, you know, she would support a comprehensive uh, immigration reform bill. And there was a comprehensive immigration reform bill that came out of the Senate, and that was bipartisan. And the House would not allow it on the floor for a vote. Uh, you know, you can speculate reasons why. But... In that, it had an ability for people, um, these undocumented immigrants, uh, have a pathway to citizenship. And they're putting out these fear um, tactics of calling it amnesty, which is scaring the heck out of the American people, which isn't right. The solution isn't to build a big, beautiful wall or to deport 16 million undocumented um, people out of the United States. Many of those would be children that are actually citizens of the United States because they were born here. So they, they earn their citizenship at that time. And, you know, that's going to split families up. But Donald Trump, in order to keep those families together, he's going to deport those citizens also. And that's going to have a devastating effect on those young people. And I understand that because I have been taken away from my family. So I understand the, the devastation that can happen to you. Representative? The, the solution does have to include border security and keeping, making sure that our border is secure. I, I think it's very unfortunate, the politics that have been played with this issue. Uh, it is it's too important of an issue. It needs to be addressed. And it's going to take Republicans and Democrats working together on that. And, and I am someone that is proven. I am able to work across the aisle 
to find the common ground, uh, and I, I'm someone that is focused on getting, getting results uh, on issue after issue. Just to clarify, does that include, you know, a quote-unquote deportation force, which has been touted by many in the Republican Party? Um, I have not supported deporting those that are undocumented. Okay. And Mr. Bacotis, you can have 30 seconds. That, that's something that the, the candidate is touting heavily, is deportation, and, and there has been no um, reversal and no talk against that as far as the Republican uh, Party that is um, behind him. But there is a comprehensive immigration bill that was put together bipartisanly by Republicans and Democrats. And as uh, my opponent has said, that she would support that. And she has not supported that. The leadership to which she is part of has not allowed that on the table to bring up for a vote. All right, moving on to the next question that uh, will be from Derek. And Mr. Pakotis, you'll answer this one first. Well, Fairchild Air Force Base remains the largest employer in our area. Governor Inslee, over the summer, greenlighted the Spokane Tribe Economic Project to build another casino in Airway Heights near the base. Now, with STEP moving forward, do you believe Fairchild needs additional protection still? And if so, why? I don't believe so. This process went through a, a cumbersome environmental impact statement. And it was fully approved by the people of Fairchild also and, and the United States um, Department of Defense also approved the process. And there was many letters from past generals and past colonels that supported the project, said that there was no, no um, concerns with the project going in where it's at. And you know, I do support the project. I do support economic development in the area. And you know, I, I do support the people that have said that the project is not going to be uh, detrimental to Fairchild or First Base. And I don't believe that, they're, you know, personally, um, I, well, I don't want to get into personal options and stuff like that because it's been um, weighing on my mind for quite a few years because of the fact that we are sovereign nations, sovereign people, and we've been battling for that forever. So this is just something that, that is, um, the, the Spokane tribe has a right to do and should not be denied. Thank you. Representative? Um, well, as you said, Fairchild Air Force Base is the largest employer in eastern Washington. And the role of the community uh, as a partner in ensuring that Fairchild remains strong is to really address the encroachment issues. We have Fairchild here because the city of Spokane many years ago donated the, the property. And it's been our commitment through the years to uh, take action, land use uh, decisions and planning decisions that will in protect both current missions and future missions. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that there were no concerns. The Air Force said they were neutral, um, and, but they made a long list of mitigation requirements. My concern, I, I, I support the Spokane tribe's efforts, and I applaud their efforts to create economic uh, opportunities for their citizens. Uh, I, have, I have stated very clearly that my concerns relate to this particular location, and I have met with the tribe and others seeking a different location because I am concerned about the, the impact on current and future missions. The training of uh, the tankers go right over that proposed site. Many every day will be flying right over that proposed site. And I, I believe that that will have a longer term impact on Fairchild. Mr. Picotis? It has been, as I said, stated, you know, the environmental impact statement was cleared of all of those concerns. As I said, you know, it passed generals and past colonels uh, of Fairchild Air Force Base had written letters saying that there was no concerns, that it was okay, that some of these um, concerns that are out there are not viable. So to say that there is, you know, that that hasn't happened, I mean, it, it's written in the record that has happened. All right, Representative, 30 seconds. Um, Fair child, we need to, we need, we just need to make sure that we're making decisions that are going to protect both current and future missions. This particular location, I believe, is of concern. I would have preferred to have seen a different site uh, located. Uh, Fairchild and the, and the leadership of the military, right now it's a tanker base. You know, the, the mission of that base changes through the years. Uh, and I, I would hate to see the, the Air Force decide that they're just going to move those tankers someplace else or that other missions that they wanted to bring to Fairchild they're not going to do for fear of um, complaints that may be filed uh, against them in the future. 
All right, Kip, you have the next question, and Representative McMorris Rogers, you'll answer this one first. Okay. I'd like to ask a, a specific question to you, Representative McMorris Rogers, and um, uh, then I'll, I'll move on to, to Mr. Bacotis. But this has to do with, particularly with um, Veterans Affairs, um, and I wanted to ask you about your draft legislation mm -hmm. that you proposed this summer. You said we'll improve care for veterans. Mm -hmm. Opponents have said the bill, as written, pushes low-income vets out of the VA system with no promises of obtaining quality care. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that criticism? Well, it's first of all, I would say that it's a, a draft bill, and we're looking, we're seeking input. My goal is to get the VA uh, focused on the veteran. You know, I get 20 to 30 calls every day in the congressional office from veterans that are having trouble getting care, and they're heartbreaking stories. And uh, unfortunately, the VA too often is not focused on the veteran, uh, even as simple as scheduling an appointment. And so I have proposed self-scheduling for veterans, like many people do in private offices all across the country, doctor's offices where you can schedule online or using an app. Uh, but the draft bill that you're referring to, it, it is a larger effort. It's a restructuring. It, it's addressing the, the culture at the VA. The VA does some things really well. And for those things that they do well, uh, let's continue that. Uh, make them the center of excellence as it relates to mental health and PTSD. Um, but veterans should also have the option of seeking care in the community, going to a local doctor, going to a local hospital, not being asked to travel to Seattle or Portland or Boise when they could get it right here in Spokane or asked to travel to Walla Walla for a, a hearing exam. Uh, we can do better. That's the conversation that I want to have. All right. And since this was a, a candidate specific question, we're not going to uh, do rebuttals, we're but uh, I believe Kip has another candidate specific question for it, you, Mr. Pocotis. It is on veteran affairs, Mr. Pocotis. And, and I guess my question, since there's a proposal from the representative, is what experience do you have in the area of health care for veterans and what specific policies would you change at the VA? Uh, I'm not a veter veteran myself, but I do have family members that are veterans. My father's a, a Korean War vet. And thinking about the bill that's going on now, and what's not told or what the people don't really understand is this is going to be privatizing the Veterans Administration. Veterans Administration needs to be fully funded to meet the needs of our veterans, which it isn't today. It's been reducing. So They've been concerned about the administration itself and the, some of the mismanagement or misallocation of funds and all of that. So what's been happening is, is they've been reducing the services also for the veterans in certain areas because they cannot afford that. So rather than doing the way that, that it's happening is to fully fund the needs of the veterans and go in and take a look at the administration and fix that administration, not complain about it, and not threaten um, the administration about, about privatizing and, and providing additional services for the veterans. That's not going to happen. I think history shows also that privatizing federal government responsibilities costs the federal government and the taxpayers even more. Can I request a rebuttal from both of them on this yeah, issue? Yeah, let's, let's do that. We'll do a 30-second rebuttal sure. from both of you, Representative McMorris Rogers. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have, I have supported record funding for the VA. The Veterans Administration's uh, budget has more than doubled in the time that I've been in Congress. It is not a funding issue. Um, despite the additional dollars, billions of dollars, uh, the VA is, is not a system that is focused on the veteran. Um, simple thing is self-scheduling. They won't do. Um, I had a veteran yesterday in my office who, because of paperwork, couldn't get in to see the VA, and he was having heart issues. Um, these are heartbreaking stories. We shouldn't be afraid of having a conversation about how we can deliver care. It's not privatizing the VA. The VA does some things good. We're going to protect that. But it's allowing some options for veterans that are desperately needed right here in eastern Washington. Mr. Bacotis. Part of my campaign is I, I uh, put together a Veterans Advisory Committee, and we meet once a month in my office here in Spokane. And we go over some, many of these concerns and, and uh, lack of resources that are being available to our veterans and the closing down. If you remember, the day after the 2014 election, the 24-hour emergency services closed up here at the Veterans Administration Hospital. So now it's a 12-hour emergency service. So you have to have your emergencies between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. 
We've also been concerned about how those resources are, are delivered out there. She's talked about being able to set their own schedules and, and appointments. I have a, uh, a member up in Republic area that has been on the phone trying to schedule an appointment for her husband for many, many days now. And she gets on the phone and it says, we'll you know, hang on, we'll, we'll get somebody to help you in, in a little while. A couple of minutes later, push number one to, to maintain your place in line. And then that continues on. So that's even more frustrating for our veterans. And if, if our veterans are actually doing that, then they're going to be more frustrated. It was the veteran's wife. In this that was, you need to wrap it up. You're thank you. out of time. Oh, thank you. Can I have another? We, we've done our rebuttal. Panel, what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, Whitney, you have the next question. And uh, Mick Morris, or Representative mm -hmm. Mick Morris-Rogers, you'll answer this one first. In 2014, Washington lost almost 400,000 acres to wildfires, catastrophic wildfires. Then in 2015, it was more than a million acres, much of it on U.S. Forest Service land, a federal agency. Experts have said that land is flat out not being managed properly and not at necessary levels to actually prevent these catastrophic wildfires that have devastated communities and left hundreds of people homeless. We have all heard the talk about needing to do more. However, at this point, what is it going to take to actually do more and better fund some of these preventative measures that could actually prevent these fires and end the cycle of fire borrowing. Well, this is this is a very big issue for Eastern Washington. The catastrophic fires that we have experienced are, are devastating and they have a, a, a huge impact on a lot of people in Eastern Washington. Uh, both the, the how we fund fight, the, the fighting of these fires as well as the, the condition of these forests needs to be addressed. I'm right now on the Energy Conference Committee. I'm, I'm pleased I introduced legislation that would address both how we fund and prevent uh, fires moving forward. That legislation passed the House about a year ago. It is now in conference committee. Uh, I'm working alongside with Senator Maria Cantwell, and I'm hopeful that we will get some legislation that will address both how we fund and fight uh, and prevent these fires moving forward. If people understood the condition of these forests, they would be outraged. They imagine that they're clean, healthy trees. One out of three acres of U.S. Forest Service is diseased, bug-infested, dying trees. We need to be taking action so that we do have healthy trees, and that's going to help prevent these forest fires. Mr. Picotas. <clears throat> Forest fire prevention has been something that Indian tribes have been uh, dealing with for many, many years, and, and healthy management forest uh, kind of de deters that. The Colville Indian Tribe has the very first integrated resource management plan in the nation, and we put that together over 15 years ago in managing our forest to a sustainable level. And that has prevented much of our forest from being uh, burned up. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service lands north of the reservation. When a fire started up there, it's usually a crown fire. By the time it hits the reservation, it's down on the ground because our, forest, our, our timber is managed properly. So you're not going to have those devastating fires. But getting back to you know, properly funding also the Forest Service and the wildfire situation, President Obama had requested funds to fight wildfires, not only to fight them but to get in front of them and make sure that we're fully equipped for the emergencies that happened. You know, and, and Governor Inslee also had done that too, but he did not receive any money at all. That, that money is, has, didn't happen for the, for the uh, wildfire situation. Uh, Representative? Yes, uh, Congress did take action a year ago to fully fund uh, the, the, the <clears throat> firefighting. Uh, and what I have, uh, I'm very excited that right here in eastern Washington, the Colville National Forest, which is a, a million acre forest, uh, I initiated and, um, and we finally got approved the A to Z project, which is allowing for longer term contracts so that the private sector can go on and, and help with the management to get in front of these fires and to take action so that we have healthy trees. And my goal is that this will be a model that will re be repeated, not just across the Northwest, but across the country. The wildfire funding that she's talking about was not near enough and wasn't to meet what the actual needs. What happens is they'll put it into the U.S. Forest Service um, budget, and that, that once that amount is taken out and, and uh, spent, then they're going to dip into the rest of the Forest Service budget. So that remain, or diminishes the amount of uh, management that the U.S. Forest Service can actually do on the properties. So properly funded, 
is going to be in the future. The funding didn't happen before the wildfire season. It happened during the wildfire season. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Morris Rogers. Um, well, I think uh, as you think about the economy in eastern Washington, what happens on these national forests uh, is, a, is a driver of the economy, especially in the northern counties, Ferry, Stevens, and Ponderé, uh, whether it's Vaughan's or uh, Boise or 49 degrees north is on the Kaaba National Forest. And so the way that we manage is very important. And I, I believe in local control. I'm excited about the A to Z project. And I believe that we should be encouraging more of those types of models that allow for us to go in and take the appropriate action uh, rather than waiting for the fires to come through. All right, Derek, next question. Representative McMorris Rogers, you answer this one first. Yeah, let's go from talking forest land to farmlands now. Agriculture, of course, remains the lifeblood of the 5th District. However, many farmers in eastern Washington are becoming increasingly frustrated with new regulations passed by the FDA. So how will you fight to keep these farmers to maintain their livelihoods and also create more jobs in the agricultural industry? Well, agriculture is the number one industry in eastern Washington. And my family, uh, we owned an orchard and fruit stand in Kettle Falls. Uh, I worked alongside my brother and parents of uh, picking cherries and peaches and apricots. And um, I'm thankful for that experience. And uh, we want, we need to make sure that we're protecting agriculture, family farms especially. Uh, and uh, what, we have great diverse crops here in eastern Washington. One of the biggest challenges that they face are the top-down regulations coming out of uh, Washington, D.C., coming out of federal agencies right now. As I talk to farmers, it's the number one issue. And I believe that there needs to be more accountability with these regulations, um, that when it comes to what the policy is going to be, that should be voted on by the elected representatives. So whether it is uh, EPA regulations or FDA regulations or uh, uh, these other agencies writing regulations, those policy decisions decisions and how we manage land, water, air should be debated by the elected representatives of the people that you can hold accountable. Mr. Picotas? These regulations are actually put in place to protect these very people that she's talking about in certain areas. Uh, in speaking with some of the farmers down in, in the Palouse area and some of my travels, some of the smaller farmers are actually being eaten up by the larger farmers and some of the corporations, the Monsantos and the McGregors and those so those regulations are developed against them to protect some of the smaller farmers and how they get their mar er, products to market. Climate change is also a huge problem for them, too. And if, if you, this summer, they have lost a, a, about 50% of their, their um, value in their wheat during the month of July. So their bushel of wheat was going to be about $4.15 per bushel. And after they've, they've harvested it, that price went down to about $2.15. It wasn't even at a break-even level for them. So there's a lot of concerns there, and then the regulations are actually in some, some ways to protect those individuals. As I said, the smaller gar um, farmers, family farmers, are being gobbled up by the larger farmers. All right, thank you. And uh, Representative McMorris-Rogers, you can have 30 seconds if you like. Well, I, I am meeting, uh, just last month I met with the farmers of eastern Washington uh, wheat growers to talk about falling numbers. Um, we're trying to get USDA crop insurance to make some changes uh, so that they won't be as negatively impacted. Um, but I go back just more fundamentally to who's deciding what the policy is going to be. And uh, for a country who cherishes representative government, the rule of law, these these decisions should be made by the elected representatives rather than the record regulations right now that we see coming out of an administration. And this isn't just, the, uh, this isn't just Democrats. Uh, Republican and Democrat administrations have been making too many of these decisions by rule. Ms. Picotas? That's interesting to hear that record regulations coming out of this uh, Democratic um, administration. I think if you go look back in history and see when many of the, the government um, functions have been growing, is when the Republicans are in charge, um, in either in the White House or in Congress. And government grows um, during that period in time. I don't know why. And many regulations are also written during that period in time. Um, so, you know, I, I believe, you know, I, I, I would be in support of the, the representatives actually being able to vote on those regulations, putting them in place, because you're representing the people of the 5th Congressional District where they do not have a voice sometimes in that area. All right, thank you. This is going to be the last question, and we're going to limit your answers to 30 seconds, and we're also not going to allow rebuttals for this last question. So you have 30 seconds. And Kip? 
Uh, this is the second time you two have faced off for this seat. What, if anything, is different in this campaign compared to two years ago? Mr. Pocotis, you'll answer Myself, this um, Name recognition has been a great help. Um, in in uh, 2014, we had about 250 volunteers working for my campaign. Uh, today, we have a little over 8,000, or 800. I would love to have 8,000. 800 volunteers working on my campaign that are spread out through the whole district. And as I said, you know, name recognition is, is basically what a lot of people cast their vote for. And Joe Pocotis has been pretty much, you know, coming from the reservation, living in poverty and outside the mainstream, is, is a name that nobody knows. But today, people are knowing who Joe Pocotis is, knowing my issues and the important things that I can bring to those individuals. Thank you. Representative McMorris Rogers. I think this political climate has just been very different this year. And the, the anger and frustration that I hear as I am having the conversation with Kathy Town Halls uh, throughout Eastern Washington and really impressing upon them that I, I share that, share that frustration and that I am turning that into ways to uh, be a problem solver and to get results and making sure that they, and I, and I believe that I am smarter today about how to get that done. Uh, and that is part of the reason that I'm running for re-election. All right, so that will be our last question and time now for closing statements. Before the debate, we flipped a coin and Representative McMorris Rogers, you'll go first. Well, just uh, let me say thanks again and, and thank you to Joe and everyone for being a part of this. I think it's an important discussion that we've had today. It is, uh, it's my honor to represent this district in Congress, and it is my uh, um, goal as I move forward to continue to, to serve the people of eastern Washington, be your voice in the people's house, and to restore the people's voice in our government. Uh, that is what I believe is most important right now in our country. That's why I've introduced uh, the USA Act uh, that will restore people's voice. Um, I am also very grateful to those who have served, those who've served in our military, the, the veterans that I have the honor of representing. My husband's a veteran, and I spend a lot of time with our veterans, uh, whether it's traveling veterans roundtables in Republic and Colville, Asotin, Spokane, Walla Walla. Uh, and I don't think there's anything more important for those who have served our country that they get the care that they need. I am committed to both giving, making sure that they have the funding, but a structure and a culture that is committed to ensuring our veterans are cared for. And I ask for your continued support. All right, thank you, Representative McMorris-Rogers. Well, thank Rogers. you, Kathy, for the spirit of debates, and thank you, KSBS, for hosting us. I so appreciate your involvement in our government and our democracy. The fifth needs something that has been lacking for the last two decades, a leader. I promise you that given the opportunity to lead, I will lead and represent your interest in Washington, D.C., not corporate interest or not party interest, but your interest. My opponent and I stand in contrast. You have a choice. I'm not wealthy, but I do have 30 years of experience in business and understand how government works also. I value cooperation and collaboration. I come from a culture that believes we have the responsibility and the duty to leave this planet in better shape for our children. It's been too long since you've had a voice in Washington, D.C. You deserve better. God willing, that's exactly what will happen November 8th. I humbly ask for your vote and the privilege to represent you and be your voice in Washington, D.C. Thank you. All right, thank you to you both. Well, that will do it for tonight's debate coverage. Our thanks to the candidates, Joe Pocotis and Representative Kathy McMorris-Rogers. I also want to thank our panel of journalists, Kip Hill, Whitney Ward, and Derek Dice. The general election is November 8th. Ballots can be dropped off at public libraries in Spokane. There's also a drop-off box at the SDA Plaza in downtown Spokane. In addition, ballots can be deposited at the elections office anytime at 1033 West Gardner, but will not be accepted after 8 p.m. on Election Day. For all of us at KSPS, thank you for watching. I'm Christy Gordson. Good night.
election programs on KSPS are brought to you with the support of CenturyLink, keeping you connected to what matters most. CenturyLink, your link to what's next.